God good? I feel such a liberty in this place. Thank you all for being faithful to the house of God. Amen, amen. It's good to have the Psalms in service with us today. Why don't we give them a hand? Amen. I have one scripture. Amen. And uh, we're going to begin there in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Good to have the Jimenez's in here. Amen. And I could go on and on and on. Try not to name names because the names that I forget. They say, What about me? That's good to have you all in the house of God. Amen. Proverbs 16 and 18 says this. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. 19 says, it's better to be it's better to be of a humble everyone would say humble a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, I thank you for your word this morning. You're so good to us, Lord. And we thank you so, so, so very much for remembering us, your people, your church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give him a hand clap of praise and you may be seated. For hundreds of years, the Jewish people were instructed by God to protect his word. And they would follow the teachings, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, They were stuck in this place of adhering to this this teaching that carried them all the way to the appearing of Jesus Christ. They didn't really realize that this teaching was only a schoolmaster to get them to where God would change the way they thought. And so when Jesus came on the scene, which was God manifested in the flesh, Jesus brought a new doctrine, a new way. And this new doctrine... It didn't settle right with the religious figures of Jesus' day. When Jesus was crucified because of hatred and jealousy and envy and pride, Jesus taught his disciples that they would have to carry on this this word, this new doctrine, which we know as the gospel. 
But it did not come without strong resistance. Many lost their lives. And so in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 7 and verse 55 through 57, we read an account of a man named Stephen. But there was also another man present, and his name was Saul. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 57, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, talking about Stephen, which, by the way, was a man mightily used in the Scriptures. He knew what he was talking about. Looked up and steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Here he was, ready to lose his life, ready to fill the stones of these men that hated him and envied him, were jealous toward him. They were ready to feel the bunt of these stones upon his body would end his life. The Bible says he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. It wasn't a literal right hand. It was signifying the hand of power. God is a spirit. God has no form unless he decides to come in a theophany, which we know as a manifestation in which God appeared at certain times in history. Then when he said this, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Who was this character, this man, this important figure that we know as Paul the Apostle? Well, Saul was a man who was destined to be one of those great religious figures, according to the world's standards. You see, Saul had so much potential, so much talent, and many, many, many gifts. I mean, like many who have a calling in life, whether you're in the church or whether you're out of the church, Saul worked tirelessly in order to achieve his goal, his calling. And so it is fulfilling our lifelong dream of becoming what we believe we are called to do is not always easy. It takes work. There are obstacles that will trip you up. There are challenges that will try to limit you from fulfilling your desire, your need, your aspirations. When you look at Saul, he fit this description to a T. You see, he invested many years into the Jewish theology. And like most Jewish doctors of the law, Paul resisted any form of doctrine that was contrary to the Jewish teachings that he was familiar with. And so when the gospel was introduced, many did not gravitate to this strange teachings because it was an alternate path. It was something different. Many Jews and Hebrews were not accustomed to change because 
This Torah, this teaching of God's word was so engrafted in their society. They refused to be molded when God appeared on the scene. Even though it was written in the word of God, they, they missed it. In his book that I've been reading, and it's a fascinating book, The Bait of Satan, John Bevere says, the human heart is like gold in its purest form. But he says when gold is mixed with other metals such as iron and copper and etc., it becomes hard and it loses the ability to be pliable and, and moldable and, and, and it, 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 it's altered from its purest form. And so the theme of the Bible is based on God being able to mold his creation. We need to be pliable when God begins to work on us, when God begins to change us because this relationship is built on compromise. Now you might say compromise is a very nasty word in the apostolic church, not if you look at it from a relation perspective. I don't know any relationship where you men and you women will not compromise with your spouse. If you become hard and you refuse to bend, your relationship that you wanted your entire life will fall apart because you, you forget. You refuse, you resist. To yield to your own, my own hardness, my own satisfaction. When Adam and Eve roamed the garden, they enjoyed God's provision. Everything they wanted, everything they desired was there, praise God. But as they became comfortable, they they lost focus and allowed other voices to influence their decisions. And as disobedience or the opportunity crept in and entered into this place of paradise, Adam and Eve based their assertion, their walk with God. They based it on lies, praise God. Lies that they allowed into their Place of habitation. Adam and Eve based their assertion on the voice of Satan instead of the voice of God. You see, assertion is defined as a positive statement or declaration, often without support or reason. And so it is when we are influenced to follow our own thoughts or the thoughts of others because of what we believe or how we feel. We can lose the ability and follow God's direction. We lose the sense of being sensitive to God's voice, amen. We become impatient. There's three areas that will cause a man or a woman to lose sensitivity with God's voice. It's the lust of the flesh. What you desire. The lust of the eyes. What you see, what you see that will fulfill those desires. And the pride of life. What you will do to get those desires. Some people will step on anybody because of pride. They refuse, praise God, to heed to the voice of God. And it is possible to lose our ability to be sensitive to God's voice 
We see this in the case of Simon Peter. The Bible says in Matthew 16 and 16, And Simon, which means to hear, his name, Simon means to hear. And Peter, which means a rock, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a revelation, Brother George. There he was in a perfect state, praise God, being sensitive to the voice of God. Jesus said, You have not received this on your own. But my Father, which is in heaven, But you see, it didn't take long until Peter pulled Jesus aside and and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it not far from thee. Lord, this shall not be unto thee. What is he talking about? Jesus was telling his disciples, I'm going to go and I'm going to lay down my life, praise God. But Peter, amen, in his pride, tried to stop the will of God. Why? Because he didn't understand. He stopped being sensitive to the voice of God where God spoke to him. In one instance, praise God, he uh, he decided not to hear. He went from being sensitive and blessed by God to totally missing the mark. And so Saul had all the tools, the gifts, the talents. But he was traveling on the road to destruction. Just for a few minutes, I want us to take a stroll down the streets of history as we discover how Saul made a decision to take the alternate path. You see, we could go one way and we can be in church and we can love God and we can praise God and we can say, God is good and, and thank you, Brother Godfrey. We could put on that face and claim that everything is good and everything is great. But deep down inside, there's a churning in your spirit. There's something that you have not released yet and it's stopping you from venturing in further into the kingdom of God. Pride and envy is very destructive if you don't allow God to deal with it. You don't have to take the alternate path if you don't want to. You can stay in the state of mind if you want to, praise God. But the Bible says pride goeth before destruction. And a haughty spirit, I'm not going to change. You're not going to tell me what to do. So let's go on this journey quickly. In Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, we are introduced to, we know him as the first martyr by the name of Stephen. Stephen's name represents a crown, a mark of royal or exalted rank. God looked highly upon this individual. A prize to victors in public games. An eternal blessedness which will be given as a prize to the genuine, the real, the ones that are not fake servants of God. Stephen's name is a name that will be echoed throughout the streets of time because of what he did, because of how he applied himself, because of how he came face to face with death, and he was not going to change what he believed in. You see, he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, was a huge, huge, huge influence in Saul's life. 
No doubt that Stephen, Stephen's death affected Paul or Saul, which his name would become short time after that. And here's the point, amen. When Saul was there and he was watching this man, amen, that shined with the glory of God, he saw something in Stephen. They all saw something in Stephen. But they weren't allowing themselves to be pliable. They weren't allowing themselves to be moldable. Pride rose up in them. And until God's light becomes our personal light, our life will always be somebody else's experience. You will never tap in to what God wants for you, what God desires for you. We refuse to take that alternate path. The alternate path to Paul's Success was made by way of Paul's paradigm shift. We see this in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. It says this. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him, to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were in the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And the Bible says, as he journeyed near, he came near to Damascus, suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, when God speaks to you twice, when he says your word, it literally means final. I'm speaking to you, praise God. When God, amen, is speaking to you, you will know, amen, that God is speaking to you. He says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you resisting me? Why are you fighting against me? You see, Paul didn't know who Jesus was at this time. He only knew that there was a power source beyond what he was able to control. And he knew that he was faced, face to face with this source of light, whatever it was. And until we come face to face with ourselves, praise God. Until we acknowledge who Jesus is and who we are, praise God. Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the golds. And so he, understanding where he was and what he did and who he was killing and who he was crucifying and who he was putting in locks and chains, sat there on that road, trembling and astonished and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You see, there was a paradigm shift in Saul's thinking. Paul, in all his greatness, would first have to learn the powerful lesson of humility first. If you ever want to be used of God, you've got to step into this place of humility, praise God. If you don't, my friend, pride has a way of 
stretching its tentacles into your life and it will destroy you. There were many a man and women that refused to heed to the voice of God. Chapter 7 of, of uh, Luke, verse 22, it says this, Then Jesus answering and said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How let the blind see, and the lame walk, and the leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in my word, in my preaching. And when the messengers of John departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness to see, he asked, a reed shaken in the wind? But you went out, but what you went out for to see, a man clothed in soft raiment, behold, they which are gorgeously appareled, look nice, act nice, talk nice, live delicately in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see, a prophet? Yea, I say to you, and much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Jesus said, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard, watch this, all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. They were thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for sending John he said, all that heard him and the publicans justified God. And then there was an action followed by your acknowledgement. Being baptized with the baptism of John. These were sinners. These were publicans. These were on a path to destruction. But God was there to offer an alternate path. But the church folk, those that lived the Torah, those that lived the five books of the Bible amongst other books, were also there to hear this word because the Bible says, but the Pharisees and the doctors of the law or the lawyers rejected the counsel of God. They rejected the word of God. They rejected the plan of God. And because they rejected the counsel of God against them being not baptized of God. They refused to repent. They refused to change. They refused to follow the ways of God. They refused to die to their own lifestyle. They refused. And so Paul, in all his greatness, would have to first learn this powerful lesson of submitting to the will of God, to submitting to the voice of God. Paul realized, amen, that he could not change the actions of another. 
Paul realized that change came to Paul and Paul alone. You see, the paradigm shift. This shift overtook Saul that day. Saul, who became Paul, realized that he was the one being held captive by his own pride and his own forgiveness. Saul witnessed something in Stephen, praise God. It was something he had never seen before. And now Saul was on the road to Damascus in this power. This power that he could not escape, he could not hide from it, was facing him, and he was facing this God of all creation. You see, there's a point, church. There's a point in everyone's spiritual walk where they are faced with a paradigm shift, praise God, an alternate path. If you're still headed in the same way where God found you, you need to have an alternate path. You need to allow God to change you. You need to be pliable. You need to get out of your own way of thinking. John the Baptist was destined for greatness. But even John realized that his greatness came when he realized, I must decrease as the Lord increases. And so it is in the kingdom of God that people are always trying to position themselves with possession. Mark chapter 10 and verse 33 says this, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem with his disciples and Jesus begins to explain the reason why I'm going up there is I'm going to be condemned to death. They're going to kill me and they're going to bury me. And you would think because they're friends of the master. All the teachings, amen, that they had received from Jesus, their Messiah. All the miracles, amen, that they, they saw and witnessed with their own eyes. And now Jesus, Jesus is going to give himself over to the ones that hated him, the ones that were jealous of him, the ones that were envious of him. You would think that they would side with Jesus, but that's not the case. Because in verse 35, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said unto them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Grant us to sit on one side, one on the right and one on the left where they should have been sorrowful for their friend, amen. They wanted to position themselves in his place. And every one of us can fall into this snare of being grafted into the sons of thunder mentality. You hear me, church. You be careful, praise God. You be careful with the spirits that you're entertaining, amen. Don't, 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 don't uh, desire greatness unless it's through humility first. <laughs> Joseph was a, he was one of the sons of Jacob one of the great patriarchs, the grandson of Abraham. And Joseph was rising up in the ranks according to his family. And his brothers did not want him, amen, to be lord over them. Because Joseph had a dream. And he said, one day you're going to bow to me. It's probably a snotty brat I agree. It's probably a mama's boy. I agree. Probably was a tent dweller. I agree. I agree with all these things. 
But Jacob loved him more than he loved all the other children, praise God, because he was a son of the woman that he loved, Rachel. So there was extra attention paid to this boy, amen, but that wasn't the way it turned out in the beginning. You see, the purpose of God, praise God, isn't always dancing through the street, praise God. It comes through humility, and God is going to put you through the test in order to humble you. So he finds himself in Egypt. And there in Egypt, amen, he's bought by Potiphar. And Potiphar had the permission, amen, position to take Joseph's life any time he wanted to. But Joseph was blessed by God, and if God blessed Joseph, God blessed Potiphar as well. And so Joseph rose up in the ranks again with another family in Potiphar's house, and he became the great slave, praise God. Because of where he was, he served. He served his master. But there were others in that household, amen, that desired Joseph. And this is where Potiphar's wife came in, came on the scene and saw the qualities of Joseph. She saw what Joseph produced and this drove her to want I could say that she was a very prideful, proud, deceptive woman. And pride has a way of wedging its way between you and Jesus. You see, the alternate path is looking at a life from a different perspective. Pride desires to have you. where your relationship with God is awesome and wonderful and all the provisions of this spiritual garden that we inhabit at this point is wonderful and beautiful. Pride also has a garden, praise God. Pride is a deceptive relationship that draws the righteous behind the curtain of death. Yes, Potiphar's wife says you can have anything you want in life. And the world will tell you, just lift up your hand against God and you can have anything you want. Relinquish. Relinquish your commitment and your devotion to God. Lie with me. Be intimate with me and you can have anything. And so it is that humanity strives to fill its greatest desire. He excels in education, and I'm not against education. And he excels in worldly achievements, and I'm not against worldly achievements as long as it's beneficial to the kingdom of God. But one day, one day, humanity will realize the stark Reality, that worldly greatness will only get you so far. Because one day in your bedroom, you're going to be there in the darkness of the night, praise God. And the voices are going to echo in your mind, praise God, of all the things, amen, that have hurt you. All the things you've been through. The voices be a constant shatter in your brain. Yes, you can have the good things in life, my friend. But without God, it's going to come to a, 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 a certain stop. And you're going to find yourself in that place that I've invested all this time. But I need an alternate path. Because it's not fulfilling my needs. It's not fulfilling the desires of my heart. And as gold is dipped into the fire in order to remove the dross, 
the fire of the trials of life, amen, will separate. It, it can separate the impurities if you let it. But if you're so stuck on yourself, amen, you will never be molded into the things, into the purpose, into the will of God for your life. You have to allow God to carry you through the fire. You have to allow God, amen, to help you as you're, as you're being hurt, praise God. Let God change your mind, amen. Change your path if you've been tormented by these things. One day, Samuel, the first prophet, the last judge, was called to anoint one person in the family of Jesse. And as he entered into this place, amen, he asked Jesse to bring your sons before. Bring your sons before me and I'm going to anoint him. And the first one he brought, obviously, was the, the one that was taller than all of them. If Samuel didn't already get a revelation, we were here before. But he didn't learn from his mistakes because he was going to anoint the firstborn of Jesse. And after he went through the whole ordeal, Samuel said, isn't there someone else? He says, yeah, but it's just, it's just a boy. It's just a shepherd boy. I want to see him. Well, the story says that David came into the presence of God and Samuel heard the voice of God and says that God looks at the heart. And Samuel anointed this boy to be a king, praise God. And so King David was given the kingdom, but David could not step into the place of authority. Even though he was anointed to do so, he could not step into this place of authority. And for years, David avoided death. For many years until God removed King Saul. You see, King Saul chased David, for years he wanted to kill him. And King Saul was possessed by evil thoughts of killing a man after God's own heart. And pride will put you in a position to slander your brothers, to slander your sisters, to slander the church, amen. And the whole time we lose the perspective of where we are in God's kingdom and what God is trying to do in God's kingdom and in your life. You see, jealousy and envy and strife and hatred must die. And these are all the qualities that Saul had. They must die before God can elevate you to a place of royalty, a place of kingship, a place of honor. But first, praise God, you have to climb into that pit and you have to be willing to lay down your life for the sake of the gospel. And when you do this, a light will permeate from your vessel, from your lifestyle. And God will elevate you into your calling. Let's stand. You will never outrun pride. 
That's why God fills you with the grace to fight it. Pride will always chase the righteous. If there's anything within you that is preventing you from stepping into a greater calling of God, I open these altars for you today. Nobody has to know. Just God. Jesus' name.